Sauropods are one of the most iconic dinosaurs of all time. In fact, I would argue that they are the most iconic group of dinosaurs on the herbivore side of things. It's probably down to their seemingly simple body plan that all kids start drawing, that being the long tail and long neck. But some sauropods were not that simple. All the way back in 1977, a group of students were practicing paleontological excavation at a road bank when they came across a partial skeleton of a sauropod, with these remains being fully described six years later as Shunosaurus lei. However, the type specimen didn't give away nearly as much as all of the subsequent studies, many of which were nearly complete or even juveniles, making Shunosaurus one of the best anatomically known sauropods. Thankfully, there's a little bit less speculation than usual when it comes to actually describing this animal. Shinosaurus looked to be a pretty standard basal sauropod at first glance, with a long neck but nothing ridiculous for a sauropod, and a head that has varied slightly across interpretations due to taphonomic deformation, going from short and deep to narrow and pointed. And we also see the usual four pillar legs, and the dinosaur measured in at between 9.5 to 10 meters, or 31 to 33 feet in length, and around three tons in weight. Now we see the usual whip-like tail with Shinosaurus, but you clicked on this video for a reason, so let's take a look at what's sitting on the end of it. A discovery in 1989 found a bony mass at the end of this tail, measuring around 20 centimeters or 7.9 inches long. Now when we think of tail weapons in dinosaurs, we will often go to two examples, spiked tails in Stegosaurus and club tails in Ankylosaurus. There have been a few cases in which other dinosaurs said, why not both? Shunosaurus was one of those dinosaurs, and this bony mass at the end of its tail also supported two spiky osteoderms that measured in at around 5 centimetres, or 2 inches each. Now it's very possible that this was for display for other potential mates or rivals, especially when we take into account the hypothesis that certain sauropods used their whip-like tails for communication as herd animals. But given the very robust, practical and overall offensive nature of this feature, the likeliest use was as a self-defensive weapon meaning this sauropod essentially had a ball and chain morning star attached to its backside. Now this would have been an extraordinarily effective weapon against the theropods of this area, but it has been theorized by many that the main use for these were as weapons against each other. Despite the peaceful nature often portrayed in media, sauropods were just animals at the end of the day, and so would have been prone to rivalry between each other, likely for mating rights. Either way, this thing would have hurt like a bit. So let's take a look at what kind of animals had to actually look out for this tale. Shunosaurus has been found in various late Jurassic exposures from the Sichuan province in China, in the temporal range of 161 to 157 million years ago. The main formation here is the Shezimiao formation, which is a relatively small but incredibly fossiliferous unit. At the time, this area was a lush temperate forest, supporting a rich diversity of life. This was by no means a large area that was captured, but the amount of fossils here are staggering and it's likely due to one thing. In this area in particular was a large lake, which was luckily fed by a river. This would explain the extremely high abundance of fossils in such a small area, with animals dying all the way up and down the estuary system before being washed in and deposited in this lake. Found here to be living alongside Shunosaurus have been various fish and amphibians, aquatic reptiles such as turtles, crocodilians and plesiosaurs, pterosaurs like Angustian Eryptorus, and a particularly higher concentration of dinosaurs. These include Ornithischians such as Agilosaurus, Hexinlusaurus and Yondusaurus, Stegosaurs like Bashanosaurus, Chialingosaurus, and Gigantspinosaurus, no less than a whopping 11 theropods, including Shromdomosaurus, Gassosaurus, Dronhanosaurus, and Yangshwanosaurus, and numerous fellow sauropods, such as Dashanpusaurus, Abrasaurus, Lamentisaurus, fellow tail club wielder Amiosaurus, and Protognathosaurus. Now with that many sauropods, you'd think that a little guy like Shunosaurus would have had a tough time competing with the big boys for food. But it was actually quite the opposite, since Shunosaurus makes up a staggering 90% of the dinosaurian fauna found here. So despite being a pretty small sauropod, this guy seemingly dominated this habitat. So what's the deal? Well, having weaponry like this is going to help massively, meaning it would take a pretty big and robust theropod to dare messing with Shunosaurus. But the secret might also lie in the small stature itself, as a short king, Shunosaurus likely adopted a low browsing feeding strategy, mowing up much of the low-lying vegetation that made up the forest floor. Given the lush forest environment, it's pretty likely that much of these areas were actually far too dense in vegetation for the larger sauropods to even fit through and feed efficiently, leaving the dense forest floor niche open for Shunosaurus. 
There's one more thing of note if we go back to that tail club for a sec too. For anyone that watched my Christmas special, you might remember me mentioning sauropod tail clubs, where I spoke about the possibility of this being a more common feature than we might think. It's really not often that we find the complete tail of a sauropod, and a study from 2024 showcased yet another tail club wielding sauropod from India, this time showing several individuals at various ontogenetic stages, named Cotosaurus. Cotosaurus is another who has been known for years, but the tail clubs were only described last year, and given that Cotosaurus, Amiosaurus, and Shunosaurus are all thought to have belonged to different families, but are all almost equally as basal, it does raise one big question, just how common were these tail clubs? Again, it's more than one species, all of which are very basal and with the potential of passing on their basal traits, and we don't actually find the very ends of the tails of most sauropods. So the possibility is very real that sauropods had more in their arsenal than just sheer size. So I'm going to let you ponder that whilst I answer today's two questions. And I've started doing two questions per video just because I didn't expect this many to be coming through, which I do really appreciate. Um, and the first one is from Harry Debaryonix Walker, who's asked, Hello, Ryan from Dinogen. My question is, did you study paleontology at university? If so, what steps did you take to get there? You have such an expansive knowledge of the field and I'm truly inspired by you and your awesome videos. Also, Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too. Uh, first up, it is very kind of you to say that. Uh, knowing that I'm inspiring someone out there is a really humbling, nice warm feeling. So I really do appreciate that because I made my day. So did I study paleontology at university? Well, I'm actually going to give a little bit of a really brief life story here because it might help some people avoid mistakes and it might help others realise that nothing's set in stone. So I did grow up wanting to be a paleontologist, but as I hit my teenage years, it didn't really seem to me like it would be a viable career that I could actually get into and was more of a kid's dream, like becoming a footballer or astronaut, etc. Uh, after that, I ended up leaving school at 16 and going to college. Um, which for any American viewers um, in the UK, we can leave school at 16 if we choose to and just kind of go into the working world or we can go to college, which is basically what you guys would call senior high. Uh, anyway, I ended up choosing subjects that I didn't really care about and I just kind of wasted my time there, didn't really apply myself and ended up with not much to show for it. I then entered the working world at 18 and ended up going through job after job that I couldn't really bring myself to care enough about. From recruitment consultancy to bin man to retailer to sewage shoveling to a suit tailors to a car pass delivery driver. I believe it was my own mum that said I've had more jobs than Barbie. Anyway, the point is I was stuck in a rut for a few years as there really wasn't anything that I cared enough about to have as a career apart from paleontology. And despite falling back in love with the idea or in the possibility of having it as a job, I'd kind of given up on thinking I'd ever become one, which put me in a pretty bad place for a while. It wasn't actually until that same mother suggested that I go to an open evening for a university in London that I actually regained a little bit of hope. You see, to get into university in the UK, you need two to three relevant A-level qualifications, which you get in college between the ages of 16 to 18, which I didn't have. But I still went, since I had nothing to lose other than a train fare, and I ended up having a really long chat with Dr. Steve Hirons. And, well, he actually saw I had a passion for earth science and natural history, along with the knowledge to back it up, at least enough to serve as a good foundation to start a degree in geology. So he took me on. That's probably the best decision I've ever made in my life, and has granted me so much more knowledge, but also practical experience, since I've worked on a few paleontology projects and field work whilst I was there, I graduated as a Bachelor of Science back in 2022. Uh, so I'm currently working as a secondary school teacher and I still have a little bit of way to go. The downside of doing this when you're a little bit older is that you have to kind of rethink how you're going to get the whole Masters and PhD whilst you've got bills to pay and you kind of need a full-time income's worth of salary to do that. But that's actually why I started this channel since if it is successful enough then I've got an income that is flexible enough to fit around a full-time PhD. So, fingers crossed. But back to the point at hand, I don't know how old you are or the requirements of university where you're from, but definitely take prerequisite subjects like zoology and geology and just fill your head with as much as you possibly can. Then pretend like you know nothing to an expert that can teach you so you can learn some more. 
Also, nothing is stopping you from getting field experience by volunteering or even visiting places by yourself, as long as you're responsible about it. Uh, so to anyone that's younger than me, you are so much worse off regretting something that you didn't try. And to everyone else, who's to say you can't try now if you think outside the box a little? Uh, anyway, our next question comes in from D. Robert Digman 1293 who has asked, What are your insights on the idea that one possible cause of the Australian megafauna extinction from circa 42,000 years ago was a temporary breakdown of Earth's magnetic field? Okay, I'll be honest, I did have to actually look this one up. So in my Australia video, I did mention how the cause of the megafauna extinction is debated between human causes, climatic stresses, or a bit of both. But the climatic stresses were thought to have been caused by the peak of a glaciation. This theory has, as you said, proposed that the temporal reversal of the Earth's magnetic field around 42,000 years ago, shown by radiocarbon dating of trees, is the root cause of this, since it would have caused a severe decrease in ozone and a massive increase in cosmic rays reaching the planet's surface. The effects this would have had is obvious, and if I'm going to be honest, this checks out. This minor extinction has a few things that stand out, and if the excursion had this effect, along with the increase in aridity and human hunting being the final nail in the coffin, those guys wouldn't have stood a chance. Uh, thank you for making me aware of that, and if anyone else is curious just to read up on it a little bit more, I'm going to leave some links to some papers and articles down below. Have fun reading, and till I catch you guys next time.